Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're talking about the scale of the Milky Way, our galaxy. We're going to try to figure out how big or how small the Milky Way is in human terms. Anyway, welcome to What The Math. So for this video, I decided to use Google Earth, an amazing, incredible tool that has been updated over the years to look absolutely and totally incredible. But before we do this, let's actually do just a little bit of scaling here. Let's determine and establish what our scale is going to be, just so we can understand how tremendously large Milky Way actually is. Now to make this scale work, we're actually going to make an assumption that one single meter is going to be equivalent to about a thousand astronomical units, or basically one millimeter, which I'm about to show you in more visual terms, is one astronomical unit. So in other words, if this right here is our sun, then Earth is exactly one millimeter away from it. So this is our Earth. And the distance between them right here, this distance right here is a minuscule one millimeter, which actually is tremendously, tremendously small. It's only about yay big. Just to give you another comparison, let's place Mars about a millimeter and a half away. Then about uh, another millimeter and a half away is going to be Mars and uh, about something like half a centimeter or basically five millimeters away is going to be our friend Jupiter. So this is around here. Now this is actually not to scale yet. I'm just trying to make this a little bit bigger. If you were to uh, make this to scale, here's actually a human finger that shows you how big one centimeter is approximately. Now we are here at only five millimeters, which is basically half this distance. And this is the distance from the sun to Jupiter. So this is our new scale. And if we were to go about three centimeters away from the sun, basically three of these fingers, we would find our very cold friend Neptune. That's the last planet in our solar system at a distance of just over 30 astronomical units. So this is about three fingers, maybe finger and a half in, in diameter. So this is kind of our scale right now. Now imagine if we were to try to compare the rest of the galaxy using the scale, and this is exactly what we're going to do. Now let's use uh, Google Earth. We're going to go and find some really cool location you may have never seen before. So how about the infamous Gundam from Tokyo, or the, you know, the famous life-sized Gundam statue located in Odaibo in Tokyo. This is actually one of the coolest thing you might see in your life, if you, especially if you're a big fan of the show. And there is that statue, you can see it, it's actually very large, it's about 20 meters high. And here what I wanted to do is kind of use this as the scale of things to come. So we're going to actually go and use the street view to first uh, zoom into this area. And there, there is the statue right there and just kind of give you an idea of where we are at right now. Now, um, we're going to maybe zoom in on one of these bricks just to kind of establish the scale again. The three centimeters of distance between the sun and Neptune was about this much. This is this is basically the distance to Neptune. The distance to the sun, uh, oh, sorry, the distance from Earth to the sun is not even visible. It's only one millimeter. It's basically this one line here. The thickness of this one line is probably about one millimeter. And if you were to go to a distance of about uh, one meter, which is the size of this pole right here, this is the speculative distance from the sun to uh, planet nine. We think planet nine is located somewhere in this region. Uh, one person here is about uh, maybe a meter and a half like this kid right here, or maybe about two meters at the tallest. The statue is about 20 meters. Now, even at this distance, we still haven't really reached much. We're still kind of technically in our own solar system. As a matter of fact, if this was the sun on the bottom, if this was the sun right here, then the top of this Gundam statue would basically be the Oort cloud where we have our comets orbiting around our, our solar system. So that's not really that, uh, not that close at all. So let's go back into this 3D view because it's actually really awesome that you're able to explore things in three dimensions uh, using Google Earth and pretty much everything here is kind of three dimensional. It almost looks like some sort of a um, SimCity or uh, City Skyline simulator. Now, all right, we're going to go to the nearest star from our solar system. 
Um, and we're going to assume that Gundam here is the sun. So basically right here, his feet are the sun. How far would the closest star Proxima Centauri be? Well, you would actually have to take a walk and you have to walk for about 250-ish meters. So from here to around the area right here. So basically from the statue up to maybe the building here or up to about the end of the parking lot here, this is the distance from our sun to the closest star Proxima Centauri. Now, just to zoom in again, there's a little cars right there. And you actually are basically walking really slowly for 260 meters and you're walking toward our sun. Now, just to give you an idea, a speed of light at this point is so slow that uh, a single millimeter, a single millimeter, which is basically not even visible on this scale, but just to go back to the picture I drew earlier, a single millimeter, this, this part right here, would actually take about eight minutes to travel. We're talking about 260 meters here, and this would actually take about 4.2 years to travel from here to here for um, light or any type of um, information. And so that's, that's pretty bad so far. Now, what about things like TRAPPIST-1? What if you want to go to TRAPPIST-1 from our sun, which is right there? That's about a distance of two kilometers. And so here we are going from the statue all the way through this park. We're going all the way here to the end of this beautiful area, possibly even further to the sport, wherever this is. And this is about 2.6 kilometers right here, actually, maybe even to the end of this whole thing. So that's how far TRAPPIST-1 would be from our um, solar system. Even if you were to walk this distance, it would probably take you about half an hour, maybe 40 minutes. And uh, imagine how long it would take the light to travel. If the light travels one millimeter in eight minutes, this would take about 30-ish years. So that so far doesn't sound too bad because these are uh, scales that we can still kind of imagine. But now let's go a little bit further. First of all, let's actually go to uh, the central black hole in the middle of our galaxy, Sagittarius A star. So now we might as well just leave this. We're gonna actually leave Tokyo. And by the way, exploring Tokyo and some of the other major cities in Google Earth is super cool. Look at that. All of these buildings look so incredible. Absolutely incredible. They did a really good job with this. But anyway, so we're going to be leaving Tokyo and we're going to be going possibly to a different country. So here, at this point, from Tokyo, we're going to take an airplane and fly all the way to the country where I reside, to South Korea. And here, even if we actually go to Seoul, the distance is still only about 1100 kilometers. We have to even go further. We have to go to China. So now we are reached China. And unfortunately, Google Earth doesn't really work there. Uh, but this, this distance, is approximately 1600 kilometers, which in our scale right now would represent the uh, central black hole. Now, just to zoom in again, remember, we're still dealing with millimeter being one astronomical unit or the distance from Earth to the sun. Now, unfortunately, don't really see much here because uh, the Chinese government prohibits people from using Google Earth or something like that. I don't really know the details anyway. So this right here from Tokyo to Yantai was about the distance from the sun to the central black hole. And this is about 26,000 light years. So 26,000 years for light to reach that black hole. And so despite this being the distance from our own uh, solar system to the central uh, black hole, you may have guessed by now where I'm going with this. The actual size of the Milky Way, the size of our own galaxy, is the size of our planet Earth. So in our scale that we use, in this scale right here, where one millimeter is the distance from Earth uh, to the sun, and one centimeter is about 10 astronomical units, and three centimeters is distance from the sun to Neptune. 
in this scale, the entire Earth represents the Milky Way. So as you can imagine, going from a place like New York, New York to a place like Tokyo might take you about 15 hours by plane. But for light to travel um, that much would be hundreds of, or at least uh, almost a hundred thousand uh, years. And so here, from Tokyo to, let's say, a location somewhere on the other side, which is basically half the galaxy, so somewhere right here, it would take the light about hundred thousand years to travel. And just to zoom in again and to show you the scale, uh, if this is the galaxy, this is the Milky Way, we're going to zoom in back to Tokyo just to see how small and insignificant our uh, beautiful solar system is in comparison to everything else. So here, let's just zoom in, try to find that park again. I think it's somewhere, so somewhere right there and right in the middle of this park, somewhere in this area, there is that Gundam figure and this is not even the solar system, the sun is a tiny, tiny, tiny pixel under the foot of this Gundam and the distance from sun to earth is not even visible in this scale. This is how tiny it is. Three centimeters would be the, the distance of sun to Neptune. And as you zoom out, you realize how tiny we are in this galaxy because we, it kind of disappears pretty quickly and there is the rest of the galaxy represented by our planet Earth. So anyway, that's all I wanted to talk in this video. And hopefully now you kind of grasp the idea of how big one galaxy is. Imagine how big the universe is. One of the most fundamental questions in science, or at least in space science, is essentially how many galaxies are there really? Now we know that we've already changed the approximate number of stars in our own galaxy from about 100 billion to possibly 2 to 300 billion, but we've also just recently discovered that our previous assumption that there were something like about 100 billion galaxies out there has actually been incorrect. Now in this video what we're going to do is we're going to use Space Engine to fly through all of these uh, different galaxies in the randomly generated or procedurally generated universe of Space Engine and then we're going to possibly go to one of them at the farthest reaches of universe and maybe even land on a planet. Now the thing is is that uh, based on the data from the 1990s Hubble uh, deep field images, we estimated that there's approximately 100 billion galaxies. This has been true for about uh, several decades now, but the new data indicates that it's actually incorrect. And so this new study by Christopher uh, Consolis from University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom shown that uh, basically this number is something like 90% too short. In other words, he actually estimated that there's actually closer to or possibly even more than a trillion galaxies out there that we just don't even see. In other words, we only see about 10% of all of the galaxies and about 90% of the galaxies are not yet visible to us because essentially the universe is expanding so fast uh, that some galaxies are still hidden from us. And to estimate this number, what they used is a kind of a really complex 3D simulation of the original Hubble images, where they made a 3D map of the uh, galaxies from something like 13 billion um, uh, years ago, and they tried to estimate how many galaxies there were originally. And then they also used a very interesting mathematical model, which basically inferred the existence of these so-called invisible galaxies that are still too far away for us to be seen, uh, but will be seen sometime in the future as they come into the view because of the fact that uh, the expansion of our universe is actually faster than the speed of light. So by the time that the light gets to us from those faraway galaxies, uh, they'll obviously be farther away, but we'll be actually finally able to see them. Now what's really really surprising is that basically 90% of all of the galaxies in our universe are essentially invisible to us right now. Uh, they are definitely there because we can kind of estimate the number of total galaxies using these ancient uh, images from 13 billion years ago and estimate how many galaxies were actually created in this um, early universe. But we just can't see them anymore because they're just way way too far away. And this was of course because of the expansion of the universe following the Big Bang. And also following this analysis, uh, the scientists were also able to show that 
the universe is essentially restructuring in a top-down fashion, meaning that smaller galaxies combine into big, bigger galaxies and create uh, larger and larger uh, structures. So, um, for example, our own galaxy, the Milky Way, may have actually been created by smaller dwarf galaxies, like, for example, large and small Magellanic Cloud next to our own galaxy. And this may have actually been the result of combination of various dwarf galaxies that there used to be quite a lot of and now there's not so many but there's still something like a trillion galaxies in total out there and the fact that the galaxies are in uh, decreasing in number in other words the fact that smaller galaxies combine into larger galaxies also kind of gives us a solution to the so-called Olbers paradox about which I talked about in a previous video or basically the idea that you know the sky is actually dark and why is it dark why there should be stars everywhere if the if the universe is so big and so large and so infinite there should be stars at every single point but there are a lot of dark patches in the sky and these dark patches can be explained by the fact that all of those miniature galaxies have actually been combined into larger galaxies and have left some space in our universe dark. And on top of that, even though there's technically a galaxy in every single point of the sky, most of these galaxies are actually invisible to us because basically we don't really see them yet. There's also a, po a possibility that a lot of these galaxies have been redshifted and our telescopes cannot detect them. And also the universe has quite a lot of various dust and um, various gas uh, flying around that actually absorbs light from various galaxies as well. And essentially that light never reaches us. And so because of all of this, uh, the night sky is actually dark and this is sort of one of the explanations to the so-called Olbers paradox. And of course, all of these findings also imply a very, very important thing about our own universe. And the, this particular finding essentially tells us that our universe is actually also evolving, just like everything else in, in the world. So initially, obviously, there were a lot of uh, smaller galaxies flying around and interacting with one another. And then uh, they eventually combine into larger and larger galaxies. And th this would actually create um, galaxies like Andromeda, galaxies like the Milky Way, and possibly even larger galaxies in the future. So maybe in a few billion years or possibly a few, um, few hundred billion years, there's going to be only a few very, very, very ultra massive galaxies that are essentially left. But for all we know, maybe this will never happen and something else will occur. But I guess what's important is that uh, the universe is constantly evolving, it's constantly changing. And uh, these smaller galaxies constantly combine into larger and larger objects. And so because of all of this, we can now make an assumption that the universe is actually 10 times more populated or I guess more uh, massive than we assumed. And that there are actually um, essentially 10 times more galaxies than we thought there were. And so the previous number of about um, 100 billion or possibly 200 billion galaxies has now been uh, reworked to about 1 trillion or possibly even more. In other words, there is so many galaxies that even if you were to visit each of these galaxies for only a minute, if you were to basically go to each of these galaxies for a minute, it would actually take you something like two million years to essentially visit every single galaxy. So basically that is a quite a long time considering that you're actually there for only one minute. This is how many galaxies we think there are today. So we've actually explored this galaxy a few times and we've even gone inside and found the supermassive black hole in one of the previous videos. But today I really wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to actually use the principles of the so-called Drake equation and basically uh, the equation that kind of predicts life out there in the universe. And uh, try to see if we can use this equation, which is actually already implemented in Space Engine, to try to discover some kind of life on the inside. Now, we're still quite far away from the actual galaxy. We're currently at a distance of 7 million light years. But because this galaxy is so large, we can actually start anywhere. But I really would like to start right in the middle. Very, 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 very close to the central supermassive black hole. So we're going to go jump into this uh, really, really large galaxy, which is currently the record holder for the largest galaxy we've ever seen. There is like 100 trillion stars here. Trillion. That's about a thousand or even more times more than our own Milky Way. 
This galaxy is also uh, about at least 10 times bigger in terms of the actual uh, radius than the Milky Way, although in this particular simulation, it is actually something like 30 times bigger. And we're moving right in the middle of this. Uh, a lot of stars here are actually really old, they're ancient, they're over 10 billion years old. And for the most part, when it comes to actual um, types of stars, a lot of these are actually red dwarfs. And that also implies that there's maybe a chance, some chance at least, that we might be able to discover some kind of life somewhere around some sort of a red dwarf in this galaxy. All right, so we're approaching the central globular cluster. I think it's this blob right there. Yeah, definitely that. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to stop right next to it. As you can see, there's a lot of dust here. It's really, really hard to see anything. We might need to actually decrease um, magnitude a little bit, just so we can see something. And right from this region, we're going to start looking for life using Space Engine, of course. Here, if I go into filter settings and I basically just keep everything the same and just change this here, give me any kind of life any kind of life at all actually let's just start with organic life it doesn't have to be uh, exotic and we'll just click on ok and uh, okay at 10 of light years nothing let's change it to 100 and do the search one more time and look at that just like that we found quite a lot of planets with life on it now this is out of 9200 stars and interestingly, because of the way that the game calculates probability or you know, possibility of life on planets, this actually gives us a lot of hope for finding life out there. And obviously this is organic life. We can do the same thing for um, the more exotic life, which is not organic. Let's start with organic though. Let's, let's actually pick, so once this starts or stops searching, we want to see, okay, so we have 466 um, planets with life in the middle of this galaxy out of 9,228. That is actually quite a lot. So let's see if we can find. Okay, so there's, there's a few with two life, two uh, two planets with life. Let's see if we can find three. Yeah, there we go. This this particular system has three planets with life on it. That's kind of cool. That's actually pretty insane. Uh, as you can see, most of these planets are type M, with some being type K. These are all basically red dwarfs. Uh, there is an F uh, star. This is actually a little bit more similar to our own sun. And there's even a G type star, which is very, very similar to our sun. Uh, but with almost uh, majority of these being red dwarfs, we're going to go into this one here. Let's see what we actually find there. So let's, let's go and jump into it. This is a red dwarf. Uh, very close to the central black hole, actually. And it's in the global cluster where the central black hole is as well. This is actually very interesting because I didn't expect to find so many planets with life here. All right, so this is what this star looks like. It's a little bit funky, actually. It doesn't have a shape. Um, for you decrease luminosity, you'll see that there is maybe some central region that's basically a core. But I think for the most part, this has kind of turned into this amorphous blob, which is not really good for life, but what can you do? There's also a lot of objects orbiting around this star, which I'm presuming are smaller planetoids and asteroids. Uh, but what I am interested in is what else it has. So here we go. We have... Wow, this is really interesting. So we have two planets here. One of them is actually a Jupiter-like gas giant. So this object, which I'm going to try to help you see by decreasing luminosity here, this object right here. And by the way, the reason it's so kind of yellowish here is really because of all of the space dust in this particular uh, part of universe. Basically, this galaxy is filled with dust and it's also filled with really ancient uh, yellowish worlds. But anyway, so this sub-Jupiter actually has what seems to be... Uh, okay, it has two moons. It has two moons with life on them. So it's not actual. It's not the actual uh, uh, Jupiter. It's not the actual gas giant. It's the planets around it. This has organic unicellular subglacial life, basically underneath the ice. 
So this is the moon of that particular planet with life underneath the ice, kind of like what we think maybe Enceladus and Europa have, if one day we might be able to discover life there. And this here has also uh, organic multicellular subglacial life. Both of them are kind of similar. So both of these are basically kind of like Europa and Enceladus. Um, then we have this other object. Let's go see what this other object is. That's called airless uh, mini aquaria. And here we have, oh, once again, subglacial unicellular life. Interesting. But this is a planet, actually. And here we have, once again, life underneath the ice layer on top. And you can kind of see the moon passing in front of this planet right now. This is very, very interesting. Uh, but not super exciting, I guess, because all of this life is underneath the ice and we unfortunately can't really get there. Now, what if we take a look at uh, one of the more sun-like objects? Let's go into the G class. There's a large moon uh, passing right now. Uh, so let's let's see if we can... Okay, we have a G6. Is there a G5 anywhere? Yeah, G5 right there. Two planets with life on it. So G5 is very similar to what our sun is like. And this yellow dwarf, which basically is pretty much almost the same mass as our sun, maybe a little bit more massive, uh, like 1%, 2% more massive, has two planets. And actually some of them are very beautiful. Look at this beautiful, unusual brown dwarf. Wow, it has a brown dwarf in the system. That's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, so we're looking at this first. This is a cold Jupiter that has a moon that also, oh, once again, subglacial life yet again. A lot of subglacial life. And as you can see, this actually is based on the prediction we currently have, where we think that a lot of these um, a lot of these glacial planets, a lot of these pl planets that have, or moons that is, that have um, ice cover on them, will probably have liquid ocean underneath. And inside of this ocean, there might be um, life. Uh, we have a super oceanic aquaria here, which actually kind of resembles Earth, except it has a lot more water, liquid water. Uh, and surprisingly, this has no life whatsoever, even though the temperature here is actually very comfortable, 10, no, sorry, minus 23 degrees Celsius. Okay, not as comfortable. But, oh, here we go, we found terrestrial life, finally. This object, uh, temperate desertic subterra with life, is essentially what we were looking for. This object seems to be very, very Earth-like. The temperature here is five degrees Celsius. It has an organic multicellular terrestrial life right on the surface. Now, I don't really know if we'll be able to see it because I don't really think the game generates uh, life on all of the planets usually. Uh, but for all we know, maybe this is it. Maybe these little patches are what life would be like on this particular planet. And standing on the surface of this planet, this is actually how the skies would look like. Incredible. Very, very different from what you observe from the planet Earth. Extremely, extremely different colors here. Uh, interestingly, there's not enough atmosphere here. There's only about 5% atmosphere of what we have on Earth. But I guess this is enough to create this unusual life formation, which I think is this, this green stuff. Maybe it's kind of like similar to algae on Earth. All right, so we found uh, regular organic life. Let's look for some crazy um, exotic life. I'm going to jump in here again. Filter settings. And this time, we want to find unusual exotic life. So this would be things like silicates and uh, maybe even other... Um, atoms and molecules that could create some kind of life. And as you can see, we're not finding as much, but definitely finding some as well. And this is based on um, other theories that speculate that we could have life where carbon is replaced with other molecules. Like, for example, the most common one would be um, uh, silicon, because silicon actually has very, very similar um, features to carbon. And it looks like here, all of these are red dwarfs. And it looks like all of these... Oh, okay, this is this is not a red dwarf. This is more similar to our own sun. It's, a, it's an orange dwarf. We found 12 planets with exotic life. And here, we're going to jump to this one. I think this is probably going to be the more interesting one. 
this is what the splatter, uh, this is what the star looks like. It's about 63% the mass of our own sun, and the object that has life is oh, it's actually a gas giant this time. This has exotic multicellular aerial life, which is very very cool. So this unusual object that has really beautiful rings actually has life in the atmosphere. Now, we think that this is maybe also what we have on Venus. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, scientists started to discover really, really unusual patterns in the Venusian atmosphere, detecting things like uh, methane that shouldn't really be there, and even um, organic oxygen. And so some sp people started speculating that maybe, just maybe, there is actually life in the clouds of Venus, kind of like the life that we have in here, in this unusual gas giant. So, here you can't really see anything, because basically gas giants in the space engine don't really have any surface, and we don't really see any life, actual life in the clouds. So maybe let's let's jump somewhere else, let's see what else we can find. Maybe we can find some kind of a more common, more typical life. So like, for example, right here, we seem to have exotic multicellular marine and also terrestrial life. So this is a little bit more interesting. This very, very cool looking planet with really unusual rings, which most likely formed because one of the moons probably approached too close to the planet and basically uh, fell apart and turned into rings. Um, we think this is what's gonna happen to one of the moons of Mars uh, in the next few uh, hundred million years. This unusual planet seems to have both terrestrial and marine life, and it's not organic. Now, I don't know if we'll be able to see it on the surface. We can definitely try. Okay, so maybe this is it. This is a very, very unusual uh, feature that you obviously will probably not find on our own planet Earth. But this kind of looks like the lifelike formation that I expected to find here. Um, possibly algae-like as well. Uh, smaller organisms, multicellular organisms that created these kind of patterns. Although... It's kind of hard to say. And also, it's very unusual that this planet is very reflective and very shiny. You can see it sparkling in the distance. So maybe just maybe this life also creates some sort of unusual pattern on the surface that makes it sparkle. Although maybe it's just ice. Well, looks like this is it. This is kind of all I wanted to do in this particular video. I wanted to look around for different types of life in the largest galaxy we've ever discovered. And as you can see, based on mathematics alone, we might be able to discover quite a lot of very unusual life there. That also means that in our own galaxy, we'll definitely find a lot of stuff as well. So we definitely have to keep looking. So you may have watched some of the previous videos where I actually talked about specific objects from the Large Magellanic Cloud. But today we're going to talk specifically about this galaxy and we're going to talk about some of the cool things in it and some of the more well-known representatives of um, this galaxy as well. First of all, let's actually go there. It's going to take us a while to get there if we go there at the speed of light. As a matter of fact, it's only, oh, not only, but it's at least 140 to possibly 180,000 light years away from us, meaning that the light that we see from it is like, at, on average, at least 150,000 years old. So first and foremost, where is this galaxy located in, in relation to our own Milky Way? Let's escape the Milky Way, turn around and take a look at it because that way you'll be able to visualize it a little bit better. So we're going to go a little bit closer to it. Stop right here. And now move away, increase the brightness just a little bit and take a look at this right here. So this is us. This is the Milky Way. We're somewhere right here. And this is the Large Magellanic Cloud. As you can see, it's a lot smaller than the Milky Way. It's about one-tenth in terms of mass and in terms of number of stars. And right next to it is its sort of unofficial sibling known as Small Magellanic Cloud. And there's actually a very unusual bridge connecting these two containing a lot of various gases. And well, mostly actually just hydrogen gas. And this bridge suggests that these galaxies were somehow connected before. And it's very likely that the Milky Way actually disturbed them. And we actually think that this galaxy was a spiral galaxy before. And once again, the Milky Way made it look like it does today. Made it look like an irregular galaxy. 
And we used to think that this is, was this was just an irregular galaxy that has no specific shape, but then we realized that it's actually a specific type of irregular galaxy known as a barred irregular galaxy, which suggests that it was a spiral galaxy or something with a bar before and was disturbed by gravitational interaction with the Milky Way and possibly small Magellanic Cloud. Now, why Magellanic? Well, if you know anything about history and exploration, there was a person by the name of Fernando Magellan. He was a Portuguese explorer a long time ago who basically was famous for exploring the world. And uh, he used these in his uh, navigation. And many other cultures used Magellanic clouds in their navigation as well. If you watch the Disney's Moana, they actually briefly mention uh, these, these uh, two galaxies. And um, the Polynesian culture specifically used them quite a lot because they were so clear to see and they were always in the same region of space. But the Large Magellanic Cloud is um, a little bit different from Small Magellanic Cloud in one major, uh, or for one major reason. This galaxy right here has a lot of really, really young, really new stars, and it's actually uh, a region of space that's kind of known for being the most active um, starburst region. Basically, a lot of new stars are created here at all times. A lot of new stars are made every single, practically every single day, actually. And the most famous region in this galaxy that, that has uh, these new stars being created is right here. And I've talked about this region before. We're going to zoom into it. We're going to go and explore it in a little bit more detail by uh, switching to manual navigation. And this region is known as the Tarantula Nebula. Now, Tarantula Nebula is actually the brightest and the most massive nebula we know, and it's also the most active um, star generation, or I guess you can call it star creation region of space, at least in the nearby regions, in, in the nearby uh, part of the universe. Now, this particular region is known for a very bright supernova that happened here in, in 1987, or I guess the light from it reached us in 1987, and it was known as 1987A supernova. And it was really, really bright. It's the brightest one we've ever seen, which means that it was a very massive star that exploded, and it allowed us to study supernova in more detail. And many of these stars are actually very young, very massive, and will explode, creating tremendous supernova. Now, the most famous region in this Tarantula Nebula is known as R136, and I made a video about it previously, you can check it out on the channel. And it's actually, we're headed toward it, it's right here, it's this blue part. Uh, well, here it's only showing you R136A1, which is a binary system of two wolf Rayet stars, and this is just some of these stars. There's like something like 70 stars in this region, and they're all very, very bright, very massive. And R136A1 is the most massive star we've discovered to date. It's about 315 masses of our own sun. And you're about to see what it looks like. We're going to make them orbit around one another. There they are. These two beautiful wolf Rayet stars that are going to, in the next million years or so, explode and create a tremendously large supernova, followed by a relatively large black hole, or possibly two black holes. And this region, R136, is also going to be um, responsible for creating a very large uh, globular cluster in the future. And this globular cluster will then result in the creation of many, many different uh, sun-like stars, or possibly even red dwarfs, that will stay in there for billions of years. So all of this will be happening right here in the Tarantula Nebula. And this is something that many scientists are looking forward to. Hopefully we'll still be around to see at least one more supernova coming from this region. Now, anyway, so let's move on um, to other important parts of the Large Magellanic Cloud. And actually, before I even talk about them, uh, I just wanted to mention that most of this galaxy is essentially just hydrogen. It's very rich in metals, and when we when we say metals in astronomy, we mean non-hydrogen stuff. So most of the stuff here is practically just hydrogen. And because of this, there's a lot of many massive stars that may not really have any planets around them. They will just uh, be made up of hydrogen, possibly like gas giant stuff. So well, I guess in the sense that this would be a planet, but there would not be a lot of terrestrial planets. 
which also suggests that chance for life in this galaxy is pretty slim, especially with all the supernova happening that would most likely destroy any possibility of life. Now what is this? Let's take a look at this. If you uh, may have not heard of this star before, but this star is actually pretty well known because it is one of the most luminous and also one of the largest stars we've discovered, known as WOHG64. I'm going to zoom into it and take a look at it just so you can see what it looks like. And uh, WOHG64 is just a little bit smaller than the largest star we've discovered, known as UY Skutai. This one is pretty big as well though. It's about, uh, as you'll see in a second, it's about eight astronomical units in radius, meaning that if we were to place this in the middle of our uh, solar system, it would very likely cover uh, Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury, and possibly even Jupiter. So it's pretty big. It's a pretty big red supergiant. And uh, it's in top 10 largest stars we've discovered to date. And all of this is also in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't have any planets around it. So we're going to escape and take a look at another star that does have planets. So there's actually at least one more star that I wanted to show you in this game, but it, it doesn't actually exist here yet. It's known as VFTS 682, which is also one of the most massive stars discovered. But that star is known as also one of the most brightest. It's about 3.2 million times brighter than our sun. And it's also located um, in Tarantula Nebula. But unfortunately, it's not present in Space Engine. But we do have another really interesting star known as S Doratus. If you type S Dor, uh, S D O R, you'll be able to see it right there. There, there is S Doratus, a very interesting, uh, very bright star that's known as the luminous blue variable star. As a matter of fact, it's a very unique star because it's one of the few blue stars that changes its brightness every few years. And because it's so bright, um, we actually are not entirely sure what exactly is happening here and why it's so bright. But uh, we today we think that it changes its brightness because it releases so much material that sometimes that material sort of covers the brightness of the star. And as it sort of cools down and um, and becomes more transparent, the brightness comes out again. So there's a lot of complex stuff going on in this particular system known as S Doratus. Uh, now, you can't really see this star with your naked eye, but if you have telescopes or if you have binoculars you'll and zoom into this area, you'll be able to see it pretty, pretty well because it is ridiculously, ridiculously bright, even though it's so far away from us. And let's actually maybe take a look at some of the planets that this particular system has, because unlike other stars in um, in this particular uh, galaxy, this star seems to have planets. Now, we don't know if this is true in reality, because these are procedurally generated, but th there's at least one planet that is known as um, Asdorator 7 that has a temperature of about 60 degrees Celsius. So maybe it has liquid water on the surface. So let's check it out. Let's take a look at it. And unfortunately, it doesn't. It's just an empty world with very little gravity, no atmosphere, and kind of looks like our own moon, actually. Well, that's very unfortunate. What about the next one here? Let's take a look at that one as well. This is known as S. Doratus 6. And this one, wow, this is actually very interesting. It does have water, but it's actually water in the atmosphere. And this at atmospheric water creates what seems to be a ridiculously strong greenhouse effect of about 500 degrees Celsius, meaning that there is no liquid water here either. Just very unusual, very thick atmosphere that we're going to go inside of just to see what it looks like. So this planet has a temperature of about 600 degrees Celsius, which is just a little bit too hot. And this is what the surface of this planet might look like if you were to land on it. And here we go. A world of S. Doratus 6. Not particularly friendly to life, and not particularly friendly to human life either. We would definitely need to have some really strong suits and some ridiculously powerful uh, capsules to survive on the surface of this planet because it's too hot and too pressurized as well. The atmospheric pressure here is like 2000 atmospheres. Anyway, so that's just some of the planets here. I think a lot of them are basically very hot 
because this star is very, very powerful and very bright as well. And the closest planet known as Asdorarus 1 is about 1.6 thousand degrees Celsius, has very, very thick atmosphere filled with helium and methane, and it's actually a scorched ice giant. This is what we would uh, act more commonly refer to as a hot Jupiter. It's a gas giant with a lot of moons that basically is super, super, super hot. And there are the moons orbiting around it. Let's actually make this run a little bit faster just so you can see how beautiful this, this becomes. And so this is Asdorotus. Not a star that is of particular interest to us, but nevertheless, it's fun to explore these in Space Engine because you never know what you're going to find. This one has quite a lot of moons, actually. And this is the essence of Large Magellanic Cloud and the most important things about it as well. One thing I didn't mention yet, and I'm going to mention as soon as I zoom out of here, is that one day Large Magellanic Cloud and Small Magellanic Cloud is actually going to merge with our own galaxy, the Milky Way, and will become part of it as well. So uh, both of these galaxies are going to collide with the, the Milky Way and then the Milky Way galaxy will actually combine with Andromeda galaxy, creating one mega-sized galaxy. For now though, that's what we have and this is what it looks like from a distance. And so here we are, right next to our beautiful Milky Way galaxy. I know I just say you got kicked out by accident and now you have to get home because, I don't know, you forgot to turn off your oven or something and something is burning on the stove. How do we do it? Well, you're pretty much, I would say, screwed without a map, but we're going to figure this out using the locations and using the objects that we're familiar with from the previous videos and also obviously just from the general knowledge of a uh, star map if you actually look into the skies if you have a nap for it uh, you may actually know some of these objects i'm going to mention so there's a um, small and large magellanic clouds these are the uh, smaller galaxies right next to us actually and i'm going to position them in this way sort of i guess you could you would call this north but it's not really north i guess you could call it galactic north but not really and Somewhere in this vicinity is our beautiful planet Earth, but that's essentially something like 50 billion stars. I'm going to have to look through a lot of stars if I want to find home. We're going to slowly go and uh, look for objects we're familiar with. I'm going to actually decrease this a little bit. And the way I'm doing this is by using objects that are large and are easy to see and that you may actually see in the sky uh, if you look at them at night. Now, this video is going to be completely unedited because I want to I want to show you that this is possible to do without essentially cheating, <laughs> without using the uh, map search function. And right now I'm approaching Carina Nebula. Carina Nebula is the largest nebula you can see in, in the sky. I've talked about this previously, and this is it. This is what I was looking for. It's a purple dot. But we want to find another nebula right next to Carina Nebula, known as, you may have guessed, Orion's Nebula. Now, Orion's Nebula has a tendency to not show up right away in the game until you find the three beautiful stars known as the Orion's Belt. And is that it? Of course that's it. There you go. There is the Orion's Belt. And there is the Orion Nebula itself. Once you find Orion's Nebula, you're actually already in the vicinity of home. Now, we just need to kind of analyze this quickly. Or not quickly, but uh, thoroughly. We're going to decrease the brightness a little bit and slowly step by step a step by step approach our home planet and to do this we need to find stars that are s closer and closer to home the first star that is kind of closer to us from orion's nebula is possibly this betelgeuse 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 three times that's right it's going to appear now <laughs> there we go it worked betelgeuse is about 470 ish light years away from us and we want to get to it because, first of all, it's a very large red supergiant. It's very, very easy to see in the sky. And it's close to Orion's Nebula, so it's easy to find. Once you find Betelgeuse, start looking for other familiar stars, specifically these bright objects. You may have already, uh, you know, found some of them and may already know how to get home from them. Um, I'm not as familiar with, with a lot of these. And maybe you are not either, but I'm going to look for the ones that I know are closer to us. Now, Betelgeuse is about 470 light years away. This is about 600 light years away, meaning that this is overshooting us a little bit. Uh, this right here is a little bit closer, but not close enough. Canopus is a good location to start. 
but I'm gonna look for something even better. Let's see if we can find something good that is um, kind of famous, I guess. But at the same time, will possibly take us a little bit closer to home. I'm only clicking on the bright ones for now because from this distance, there's absolutely no way you'll be able to see the sun. Now, Antares uh, in the Antares Nebula is actually a very good location to go to, but this is once again overshooting it a little bit, but you can uh, definitely look for things there. This is a planet. This is Betelgeuse 8. It shouldn't be here. Um, now, let's see if I can find what I'm actually looking for, and I'm looking for one of two things. Possibly Aldebaran, which is a very bright but also very close star to us. Or there you go, that's a good, th this is a good location. Bellatrix. It takes us about 190 light years closer to to our, um, our planet, to our star, and also allows us to see other objects a little bit more clearer. Now, using Bellatrix, I'm going to try to locate um, something else that is relatively bright. Oh, there we go, Aldebaran, look at that. So see how bright it is compared to everything else? This is actually with decreased brightness. This is what it actually looks like. Um, orange giant, so it's a binary orange giant. His two stars, one is a, obviously an orange giant and one is a red dwarf. I believe it's a red dwarf. Yes, it is, I was right. And so from here, we're only within like 90-ish light years away. This is basically our home, practically. Now, here's one thing you can do. Now, it's actually very hard to see sun from here. It's still very, very dim. It's going to be as dim as some of these stars right here. If I click on this, this is essentially how dim the sun would be. You can obviously start... Oh, wait. Is that it? No, that's not it. Are you serious? Is that actually it? No way. <laughs> that was completely by accident. Oh, okay. Well, that's not fun. <laughs> I found it. Yay. What I was going to show you is this. From here, the easiest way is to find the Antares Nebula. It may actually show up and we may not load correctly, but if you click on it, it will show up right away. And start uh, moving toward it until you start seeing other stars. Now, right here you should see Sirius, and right here you should see uh, Procyon, and you may also see um, Alpha Centauri. Is that it? Let me, do, let me guess that. Yeah, there you go, Alpha Centauri. Alpha Centauri is the closest star to us. And as soon as you get to Alpha Centauri, look for, obviously, an orange star, which is right there. You can see it moving right here. And this orange star is home, solar system. Now, that's, you know, halfway home already. And then comes the easy part. Going to zoom out of here, obviously, and look for the third planet from the sun. And here's our home. And now you can just land wherever you left your oven on and basically go and turn it off. And so essentially, this is how you can kind of, you know, use your knowledge of space and your understanding of, of, you know, star maps and star systems to try to locate where you actually are in this beautiful galaxy Milky Way. Now for this video, I, I think I'm going to be using mostly Universe Sandbox Square, but we're going to use Space Engine just a little bit as well. And uh, here, we're going to just basically talk about various facts that you may have not been aware of. The first fact is actually, I'm going to recreate using this particular galaxy right here by adding um, two supermassive black holes to represent two galaxies that are very, very close to our own Milky Way. Now this, is right, uh, this right here is Small Magellanic Cloud and this right here is Large Magellanic Cloud. And the first fact is this, what you may have not been aware of is that our um, galaxy is actually not entirely flat. It is a flat looking galaxy, but it does have two bulges that I'm going to try to create right here by having these black holes that are quite massive actually, pass relatively close to uh, the Milky Way. And there we go. You can see there's a bulge forming right here. And there's another bulge forming right here. These bulges are actually real. Maybe not as massive and not as pronounced as I've created here, but they do exist. And these bulges are formed because there are two smaller galaxies orbiting very, very close to the Milky Way. And they basically create this kind of a formation uh, warping our own galaxy. This is a little bit too extreme, but it does look something similar to this. Now, the next fact is about the dark matter present in our galaxy. Scientists today believe that there is actually a very large halo that you can kind of maybe see right here around our galaxy. 
that is entirely made up of the elusive dark matter, the material that we don't really know what, it's, what it is, we don't really know what it's made of, but we know that it exists because if it wasn't there, our galaxy would have actually not been able to maintain its shape. So the dark matter makes up uh, up to about 90% of the total mass of the galaxy. I'm going to actually add maybe a little bit more just so we can kind of tell some of it apart. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's just add a bunch of it until the simulation really slows down. So there's a lot of dark matter around this galaxy right now. And this is essentially the, uh, the so-called halo that is around our Milky Way at all times. Every single galaxy we've seen so far has these halos. And we've even seen the interaction between various galaxies and their halos as well. Especially when the galaxies collide. And interestingly, some galaxies seem to actually have up to about 99% of dark matter. With only 1% of visible matter that you see right here. So the halo is there even though we can't really see it now there is a little supernova going on there right now that's because the simulation is actually uh, called supernova in the galaxy but what i really wanted to mention in the next fact is the fact that we actually have so many different stars in our galaxy the recent estimate it puts this at about 400 billion stars in total so in this chunk right here in this galaxy the milky way there's like 400 billion stars that is quite a big number there is more stars in the entire galaxy than there is grains of sand on the entire planet earth if you were to walk around earth and collect every single grain of sand you would still not have enough to basically count all of the stars in this galaxy so that's essentially how many stars we think there is at least by today's estimates Anyway, let's go to the next fact, and that's the fact that, uh, as you can see in Space Engine right here, our galaxy is actually very dusty and it has up to about 15% of dust and gas that just kind of floats around without really being a star, without being anything else. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons we can't really see the central region very well is because it's actually covered by a lot of this interstellar dust. So even though our galaxy is about 100,000 light year, years across, we can only really see about 6,000 light years into the disk uh, because most of it is essentially just covered by dust and we, we need to use infrared telescopes to see the rest of the galaxy. But luckily, infrared light passes through this dust so we can usually use infrared telescopes to try to see the rest of the galaxy and estimate its size and of course its structure as well. Now, the thing about our galaxy is that it was actually created from the collision of smaller galaxies, and this is what I'm trying to recreate here. The galaxy Milky Way, as well as Andromeda Galaxy, have all been created from the collisions of these smaller galaxies over the billions of years. So, as a matter of fact, our galaxy was much, much smaller before. I'm going to try this again. This didn't really work very well. So let's try to collide these, uh, I think, seven or eight smaller galaxies and try to create one large mega galaxy if we can. So essentially, over the period of billions of years, uh, smaller galaxies collided into one big galaxy that today we know as the Milky Way. And in the next few billion years, we'll also receive a collision from a small Magellanic Cloud and large Magellanic Cloud, and of course, the Andromeda Galaxy as well meaning that we'll eventually create some kind of a mega massive uh, galaxy that will be dominating the local region uh, on the local cluster of galaxies. So let's see if we can actually have these galaxies collide with each other to create one massive super galaxy as well. And so after about 2 billion years, it seems like we've been able to combine all our supermassive black holes into one and now this galaxy will actually stabilize and become uh, its own massive circular or possibly elliptical galaxy. And this is essentially what happened to our own galaxy as well. Now, speaking of, you know, the way that our galaxy looks and the way that it's portrayed in the media usually, we think that our galaxy looks this way, but every time you see a picture of this, this is actually not real. We are located right around here. We cannot possibly see the galaxy from the outside. Everything you see so far in, uh, in the media, on all of those websites you may visit uh, related to space sciences, always show you the artistic rendition of our galaxy or possibly show you the Andromeda galaxy. It's not the real representation of the Milky Way because we can't see it. We only see it from the side, from within it. Just a little clarification. Anyway, so let's move on. The other thing we know for a fact is that one day we're going to collide with with the Andromeda galaxy that you see right here, and this is the Milky Way. And about 4.5 billion years later, they will actually collide 
in a very spectacular fashion. We might not be around to see it, but it will happen. And when it happens, they will combine into one major elliptical or possibly spiral galaxy. And they will become the biggest galaxy in the region. So here uh, is this event unfolding and happening in somewhat real time, although accelerated dramatically. The thing is, even though you see a lot of things combining, almost not a single star, or actually very likely not a single star, will collide with another. There will be no stellar collisions, there will be no planetary collisions, and I've actually talked about this in one of the previous videos where I did the math and explained why none of these stars will collide with each other. The collisions are extremely, extremely rare. For a collision to occur, these galaxies will have to be at least 10 times larger and have at least 10 times more stars for at least one collision to occur. As it is though, there will be no collisions, they will just kind of combine into one and in this case, maybe none. Maybe they will just kind of destroy each other. And that's at least in this particular simulation. In reality though, we think it will very likely combine into one massive, ga massive galaxy that will most likely be known as Milkdromeda. And this Milkdromeda will of course still stay a member of other galaxies known as the local cluster. Now, our own local cluster contains approximately 50 or so galaxies near us or within the vicinity of us, including some of the larger ones like Andromeda and uh, some of the smaller ones like the small Magellanic Cloud. But for the most part, uh, all of these galaxies are always kind of together, and this is what we call the local cluster. But if we were to zoom out dramatically, we would realize that we also are, are a part of a something much larger known as Virga Supercluster, and that is a part of even something larger known as Laniakea, which is our local supercluster. Also known as the Greater Supercluster, and Laniakea. And this is essentially something that we've talked about previously and something that I think I'm not going to mention here because we're just talking about the Milky Way. And one of the last things I wanted to mention is the fact that, well, like everything else in our universe, Milky Way is obviously moving. And it currently moves at about 600 kilometers per second um, in relation to the background radiation and it moves toward the Andromeda Galaxy. And obviously on top of that, our own solar system, our own sun moves around the central black hole and our Earth spins around the sun. So the speeds involved are quite dramatic and uh, this suggests that nothing in our universe is ever standing. It's always moving somewhere. And of course, our sun itself also orbits around the supermassive black hole and it takes it about 200 million years to orbit once. Meaning that in the entire lifetime of our um, galaxy, which is about just over 13 billion years old or just a little bit younger than the entire universe, uh, our sun has orbited it approximately 25 times. And welcome back. This is Universe Sandbox 2 or Universe Sandbox Squared and we're going to be using this game to try to, uh, well first of all explain what uh, quasars and blazers are, but also just talk about uh, their structure, their features and so on and so forth. Unfortunately neither Space Engine nor Universe Sandbox 2 actually have any quasars or blazers or any other AGNs or so-called active galactic nuclei uh, objects in their uh, repository. So here, even if I go through all of these, I will not find any quasars or blazers or anything like that. So I have to make one from scratch. And this is actually good for us because that way you'll get to visually see what they are and what, uh, how they basically are made. And I guess we should just start with the basic definition. So quasars and blazars and radio galaxies are all galaxies. They're not just stars, they're actually very, very large galaxies that have a massive, a super massive black hole right in the middle, right at their center. And this is what makes them different, actually, is that they're, um, they're called active galactic nuclei, because if you were to go really, really close to this black hole, what you would see is that this black hole is actually absorbing and eating up and basically destroying a lot of various uh, stars, a lot of various uh, matter, and it's just kind of taking it all in, and uh, it, a lot of it starts accreting around it and creates an accretion disk, and because of this accretion disk, uh, so much energy is produced that, uh, and also so much uh, electromagnetism is produced that a lot of the magnetic powers, a lot of the magnetic forces create these two sort of uh, rays going uh, sort of up and then down. 
and these rays are what uh, are what we're actually interested in. But to, to make those rays happen in this game, we're going to have to cheat a little bit and use pulsars. I'm going to show you how we're going to do this in a second. Well, let me just actually show you what I mean by this. So imagine, so this is a black hole right here. Now, earlier on in the creation of every galaxy, um, every galaxy goes through a stage when there's quite a lot of matter in the middle. A lot of the stars come really close to the central black hole. And as this black hole grows in size, a lot of this matter gets absorbed. It basically gets sucked into the black hole and uh, some of the leftovers start orbiting around creating an accretion disk. An accretion disk that sort of possibly looks something like this, except it's much more massive, much more energetic, and much more uh, better looking as well. Something that we may have seen in the movie called Interstellar. Now, so this, this accretion disk is created by the, all of the matter that is sucked into this black hole. And um, as it sort of spins the matter, it accelerates it to the point where it produces so much energy that, uh, and so much electromagnetism that basically this is not only a very big magnet, but it's also a very, very highly energetic um, environment. And a lot of this energy starts being projected in two directions. It goes up and then it goes down. So 90 degrees or perpendicular direction from the spin of the um, accretion disk. Unfortunately, we're still not 100% sure why this happens and how it exactly works, but we know that it happens because we can observe it uh, in space. And anyway, so this is the black hole that we have with the accretion disk. And what happens next is really interesting. So let's just actually throw a few uh, stars into this just to give you an idea what's happening. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to place a bunch of stars around this black hole, uh, simulating uh, an environment where many of these stars didn't really get really lucky, or even this big one, uh, didn't get very lucky and got basically uh, sucked into this black hole. So there's some of these stars will be very, very large. And this will be quite interesting to observe. So basically, this is a simulation of what an active galactic nuclei looks like. And this was very common earlier um, in the universe when a lot of the early galaxies were basically uh, uh, saturated. And they not only saturated, but they basically had a lot and a lot, a lot of these... Um, early stars that basically didn't get lucky like i said and ended up inside the black hole so uh, we're going to continue the game we're going to unpause it and let's see what happens so as these stars approach the black hole they will most likely uh, or not most likely but very likely get sucked in and uh, get destroyed as well and as they get destroyed they release such an, a massive amount of energy um, that uh, these, unfortunately we can't really simulate this here, but we're going to do this in, a, in some other way, that um, these two streams going up and going down increase dramatically. And this is why quasars, blazers, and all other uh, active galactic nuclear objects um, have such a, a, a variable luminosity. In other words, they actually change the luminosity depending on how many stars are being absorbed by this particular black hole. And in reality, all of these active galactic nuclear objects work exactly the same way. There is a central black hole that is very, very massive, and it suddenly gets quite a lot of material get, that gets sucked into it and basically gets destroyed in the center. And uh, the energy that's created by all of this is then projected um, in two directions from the galaxy. So here comes the first explosion, and unfortunately it doesn't really do the whole jet thing that you would see in real life. Uh, it just kind of explodes as soon as it approaches the black hole, and there you go. They, they start approaching the black hole, and no, where are you going? Come back. Oh, it's flew to, f f way past the black hole. It's probably going to collapse with Antares, and there might be actually a supernova afterwards. But as you can see, they've absorbed quite a lot of the... Uh, particles that I had around, they were representing the accretion disk, which actually accelerated my game. So here comes the second explosion, and look at that, Rigel is coming back, it's coming back for another spin, because the gravity of this black hole, uh, which is actually exactly the same black hole as in the center of our galaxy, called Sagittarius A, is actually uh, making a return, but... It still missed. Wow. Okay, I think it's just too large. That's probably why. So as as these stars get absorbed, they release huge, massive amounts of energy, and all of this energy is released, and this makes uh, all of these objects called active galactic nuclei. Uh, all of these objects are the brightest objects in our universe, specifically objects called quasars and blazers, because. Uh, as I will explain to you in a second, they create something called a superluminous stream, also known as 
relativistic jet, which basically is a jet of energy and particles uh, that is so fast and so powerful that it basically emits a lot of various um, high energy particles and high energy radiation that we can then detect on Earth. Now, is this ever going to happen, Rigel? Are you ever going to go and get swollen by that black hole or what? It's just being difficult. I think it's too large. I think big stars have trouble getting swallowed by a small black hole in this game. And that's okay, I'll forgive them. Anyway, so basically this is kind of what happens. They get swallowed up and they uh, uh, emit a huge amount of radiation and energy. Now to try to simulate all of this and try to simulate uh, what an actual quasar looks like, we're going to use this um, galaxy simulation. This is actually the one that's called Supernova in the Galaxy. I just kind of removed the supernova and I removed the star. And we also are going to remove the central black hole. Uh, but before we do that, let's slow down time because if I remove the central black hole now, things will start flying away way too fast. And now right here next to the black hole, what we're going to do is we're going to place an orbiting white dwarf around it. I'm going to explain to you in a second why we're doing that. Uh, so let's place a white dwarf. And we're just going to pick this one right here, GJ1221. And it doesn't really matter where you place it, just place it somewhere. And so th this is just so we can actually create that something that looks a little bit more like... Um, a pulsar. So we're gonna now remove the black black hole, go into the uh, white dwarf, and play uh, make it total velocity zero because we don't want it to fly away from us. Now go to materials. I'm gonna use this new button called Make Pulsar. Ta-da! This should have made a pulsar. Did it make a pulsar or not? And here we go. I just made uh, one and named it Quasar. We can, you can obviously name it whatever you want. Now, this is our start of our manually made Quasar slash Blazer. Now, next step is what we're going to do is we're going to... So, uh, the reason why we're doing this is so that we can have these two jets coming uh, out of the black hole or pr pretend black hole in this case going up and down. So, this time what we're going to do is we're going to go down here and increase the magnetic field by like a factor of a million. So let's just add a six zeros in here and this will hopefully give us enough magnetic, no, even more than that. Let's add a few more. Let's actually add maybe a few more zeros until this becomes a very prominent, there we go, very, very prominent looking stream. This is what I was looking for. Now, as you can see, there is actually two streams coming out of this uh, particular galaxy. And this is essentially what a quasar would look like, except maybe I think it would be maybe a little bit more straight than that. So let's see if we can straighten this out a little bit. Okay, I think this is straight enough. So let's just talk about what quasars and blazers are in terms of us seeing them. So imagine a galaxy and right at the center, they ha you have this very, very active black hole that is absorbing a lot of matter. And a lot of this matter is propelled up and down in this way. Now, if you're looking at it from a distance, from sort of like this, this angle, you're observing something called a radio galaxy. Radio galaxy is essentially uh, a galaxy that is emitting a lot of radio waves, a lot of um, really interesting uh, spectrum of uh, low sort of radiation. And if from a distance, it would obviously look more like this. So it's not particularly bright. It's not particularly interesting. Or I mean, it is interesting, but it's not uh, specifically that interesting compared to quasars and blazars. Now, some of these galaxies are under this angle to us and they show us their face a little bit more. Now, this right here, anywhere sort of, any sort of angle that is in this way is called a quasar. So quasars are a lot more bright and they're a lot more uh, interesting in terms of spectrum that we receive. We get a lot of different uh, high and low uh, frequency radiation from them. We get a lot of uh, X-rays, we get a lot of gamma rays. We also get a lot of uh, really interesting effects that sometimes make it look like the light coming from them is actually traveling at faster than speed of light. And that's because they're so far away that they're creating this sort of effect called super luminous emission. Now, this is uh, what happens when you have um, something that comes out of uh, the black hole at almost the speed of light, but because you're observing it at a slight angle, it uh, and over time, over sort of years and, and th millions and millions and billions of years of travel, it essentially kind of uh, looks as if uh, this object or this light was traveling faster than the speed of light. Uh, unfortunately, this is an optical illusion, not an actual physical phenomenon, so 
And what I didn't mention is that a lot of the stuff that comes out of these jets, uh, so coming from the black hole up and down, a lot of the stuff moves at the speed that's very close to speed of light, it's about anywhere from 95% speed of light to about 99% speed of light. So it's probably the fastest sort of particle accelerator that we can find in the universe. Now, that's quasar, and this is what quasars look like. So basically, it's when it's under a bit of an angle, but not exactly straight on. Now, what happens if you look straight in the middle? And this actually is what we're really interested in right now. This is actually what the most interesting object, in my opinion, is. And this is, of course, called... And I'm going to rename this now. This is what you would call a blazar. So if you're st staring right in the middle and you get this absolutely ridiculously bright object, this right here is what blazars are. So essentially, it's just a different angle of looking at things. Um, so it's it's still the same object. It's still the uh, super active uh, galactic nuclear because of the black hole that's absorbing a lot of this light. And I'm actually going to accelerate time a little bit so you get to see what it looks like. And if you're staring right into the ray, you get blazar. There's not that many that we have found because having a, you know, a, a chance of a quasar aligning itself uh, so it stares directly at our planet is actually relatively low. And so there is not that many blazers that we found, but we did find something like a million of different quasars. Quasars are a lot more common because it's more likely that you'll be observing these active galactic nuclei at an angle, not exactly uh, staring right in the sort of eye of the uh, a black hole, but you're going to be more likely to observe them this way. And obviously the um, radio galaxies are also very common where you're basically just looking at them from the side. So here's a, the summary of everything here. This is essentially how they're classified today and what we know about them today. So they're not uh, particularly mysterious anymore. They used to be very mysterious objects. We actually could not really understand how they work and what they do. But today we are absolutely convinced that it's because of the supermassive black hole and the supermassive black hole creates these jets, particle jets that release energy really fast. And we actually even have pictures of them from Hubble telescope. Here's one, for example, where you can actually see the jets coming out of a black hole. And there's actually uh, some recent discoveries when it comes to quasars. We've actually discovered some really cool things about them. One of the things from, from last year, actually, from 2014 and 2015, is that we've discovered that a lot of them have such a varied um, luminosity. In other words, they change luminosity so fast that we realized that uh, they can change uh, from active nuclear galaxy to basically a quiet uh, or inactive galaxy within years, not even millions of years or thousands of years, but within our lifetime. So uh, one of the scientists that I'm going to be talking about in the weekend's video, because this is actually recent news, this, and her name is Stephanie Lamassa from NASA. Uh, and I'm going to be talking more about her during the weekend uh, news with What the Math, where we talk about space news. But basically, yes, she discovered that there is a quasar that she found that changed from being super, super bright to almost invisible uh, within 10 years and uh, now we found even more of these so we know that their luminosity their activity their actual sort of coolness their their um, black holes that absorb all this energy and release it can change uh, within years and it's a very sort of volatile volatile process that can uh, change this from a quasar to a normal galaxy within several year period and the other thing that's uh, very interesting that was found very recently as well is that our galaxy also emits these rays, but they're not as prominent. So actually all galaxies emit, emit these rays. Um, when a black hole in the center starts absorbing anything, it starts emitting these rays. And uh, we actually discovered that our galaxy has a very, very slight sort of emission of these, uh, these two rays. And so if there's a galaxy somewhere far away and possibly even a planet habitable, inhabited by some super smart species, and they're actually looking at our galaxy and they're seeing this they're probably also might even be wondering so what's going on in there and you know is there anyone in that particular galaxy that is alive and is intelligent and uh but one thing i didn't mention is that a lot of the quasars and blazers we're observing right now are ridiculously old remember the light travels at speed of light and the light we detect from the quasars and blazers that we see today is billions of years old. So in other words, what we are seeing is no longer there. They are probably just normal regular galaxies that don't even have this anymore. They probably just look like this or maybe something completely different. They might even be a completely different shape by now. 
Uh, so the blazers and quasars are not really permanent objects. They come and go all the time and even our galaxy may one day become a blazer or a quasar or basically it will acquire an active galactic nuclear if a lot of stars come within the central area of the black hole or when Andromeda galaxy comes to visit uh, and uh, collides with our galaxy if a lot of stars approach the supermassive black hole that forms as a result of, um, of the merge of two galaxies we might also get uh, or we might also become uh, a blazar or a quasar so yeah, a lot of these objects come and go and as I mentioned before, we currently have a list of approximately a million of um, quasars and approximately 1,500 blazars. So in other words, there is approximately, specifically 1,580 objects as of uh, late 2015 that are staring exactly at us in this fashion. We can actually see them and they're super bright. They're so bright in fact that if you uh, if you watch my luminosity video and that where I compare different luminosities, their luminosity is minus 26 to minus 27. So from a distance of 10 parsecs, they would be the brightest objects in our night sky and they would look somewhat close to the uh, luminosity of our sun actually. And their luminosity is actually usually higher than the total luminosity of all of the stars in the actual galaxy. So if you were to combine luminosity of all of these stars and then if you were to look at the actual blazer in uh, sort of face on, this would be brighter than this which makes it a pretty interesting phenomenon. And the galaxy we're going to be talking about is known as Segway 2 Dwarf Galaxy. It's actually very, very tiny. It contains only about a thousand stars. In comparison to the Milky Way, it contains close to about 400 billion stars. And uh, it's actually not very far from us. Well, in terms of astronomical terms, we're going to create this from scratch because it's actually it's a galaxy that's kind of hard to find. It doesn't exist in this game, it doesn't exist in Space Engine, and we will need to basically create it by ourselves from scratch. All right, let's pick a black hole that's not too big, not too small, maybe about 10,000 masses of the sun, and we're going to place it at a distance where um, this particular galaxy is located. So this is going to be only approximately 114,000 light years away. So somewhere around here. So we're going to place it right here. It's actually not in this particular region of space, but this is just to make it a little bit easier. We're also going to now zoom in here and change this black hole, making it a little bit less massive. So let's let's make it about, I don't know, like 900-ish masses of the sun. This is going to be called Segway 2 Dwarf Galaxy. Now, this particular galaxy is interesting for many reasons. One of those reasons is because we were actually looking for galaxies like this for quite a while since they um, kind of showed to us how the universe was created and um, when we look at the models of universe creation, uh, theoretically these galaxies should be created as well. And we finally discovered one a few years ago and it's not very far from our own galaxy, the Milky Way. It's actually uh, technically located somewhere underneath the Milky Way, but I decided to place it side by side just to make it easier it's on the eyes and easier to compare. So how are we going to add um, stars to it? Because this is obviously a galaxy that needs to have stars. So first of all, we know that this galaxy contains something around uh, like thousand or so stars. It's not, not that many. And because it's cl classified as a dwarf spheroidal galaxy, also known as DSPH, um, all of the stars here are going to be in a kind of a spherical formation. So they're not actually as flat as our own galaxy. These are all going to be spherical. So we're going to go into rings here and we're going to place um, a manually generated ring system around this particular object. And here's what we're going to click. We're going to click this button. This will create bodies. We're going to create thousand bodies, which will be our stars. And we're also going to make it uh, so that the mass will actually depend on the total mass of this galaxy, uh, of this black hole, actually. Uh, now, what we need to do is change the shape to sphere. And this will fill the sphere. It will be random, randomly generated sphere. All right, cool. Let's see how this works. Actually, no, wait, radius. Let's make sure that it's placed far enough from this galaxy because we don't want it to be too close. The actual diameter, or I guess the radius of this galaxy, is uh, relatively big. It's uh, something about uh, something around like 34 parsec, which is approximately 100 and 
15-ish light years. Uh, but we're going to make it just a little bit smaller. Well, actually, we're not going to go that far. We're going to make it maybe, I don't know, just like a few light years across. So here we go. Boom. And the game suddenly slowed down to a crawl. All right, so at least we were able to create this galaxy. Look at that. A thousand stars. Whoa, this is crazy. It's my, I actually for a second thought my game crashed. Um, but this is essentially what it would look like. Maybe, okay, maybe not this dense. This is a little bit too dense. So each of these little stars represents um, a tiny star inside Segway 2. And I think I placed them a little bit too close to each other. So I may have to actually... Um, I may have to place them a little bit farther away, but for now, this will actually do. Uh, what I want to do, though, I actually want to remove all the labels and maybe decelerate this a little bit. And yeah, this didn't really help at all. It's still super, super slow. But essentially, this is what uh, this particular galaxy looks like. And it's very, very dim. It's very difficult to see. And we, we found it completely by accident um, using one of the um, infrared telescopes. Uh, maybe a few years ago when we were looking for other objects near our sun, near our solar system that may actually have very bright infrared exposure, but not very bright um, visual exposure. And so this was how we found this particular galaxy. This was during the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, back in 2009. So I guess you get the idea of what this looks like in terms of size and also in terms of uh, the distance from our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So maybe let's actually start a new simulation, make this a little bit more manageable on my computer. We're not going to make thousands of stars. Let's make maybe a hundred. Another manually generated Segway 2 galaxy, this time with a slightly more realistic distance. Um, and let me see if this worked. Yeah, okay, so these are all mass, uh, uh, one mass of the sun. And if I were to zoom out, you would actually see that uh, this time, this is actually a lot more realistic in terms of the actual size and the spread. But we only have a hundred stars here. So I can maybe place a few more until my computer starts struggling. So let's place a few more. This is 200, 300. Okay, good. 400, 500. Okay, I can do 500. This is not too bad. The frame uh, frame rates per second is around 30 right now. This is perfect. So um, all of them are called moon because that's the way that this game generates um, random objects. But you can see that all of them are actually stars, very similar to our sun in, uh, in parameters. So basically, it's one mass of sun. And if I were to kind of maybe remove the labels again, you would see that it looks pretty cool, actually. So you, can, you don't really see them just yet, but if I select all of them, or I guess if I just select them individually, they actually start appearing. There they are. There's 500 of them here. And maybe we can make them a little bit more visible by doing this. And look at that. Here we go. So here is an example of essentially a, a spherical dwarf galaxy. This is what they all look like. It's a bunch of stars um, around a somewhat massive, but not super massive black hole right in the middle. And right in there, right in the center, we can probably find this beautiful black hole that's surrounded by all of these beautiful stars. So this is what Segway 2 might actually look like from the center, from within the actual galaxy. But what's really interesting about this particular galaxy is that its actual mass is close to about 550,000 solar masses, which suggests that one is that these stars that are in this particular galaxy are really old and really massive. And two is that the actual black hole is a lot more massive as well. So this is not a truly realistic representation of Segway 2. Um, the other thing is that there is no more stellar generation here. In other words, new stars are not being created. So this is technically what you would call a dead galaxy. It can only start creating stars again if it collides with another smaller or I guess bigger galaxy. And then some of this gas combines into other gas and stellar generation will resume again. But for now, it's actually that galaxy with very um, old ancient stars that are close to about 12 billion years old. Many of these are very um, metal poor, meaning that they don't probably have any planets. They don't have any objects that are not made of hydrogen and helium. And so for all we know, there's very likely to be very few planets here, very few colonizable, habitable planets, very few objects that might be interesting to us. 
but it definitely explains to us how the universe was made and it definitely shows us a little bit about um, how our universe and how our galaxy were created. And the other thing about this galaxy is that we know that it's technically bound by dark matter, so it's possible that a lot of its mass, if not most of its mass, is actually dark matter. And so many of these stars could actually be a lot smaller than uh, what I've created here. And even the black hole could be smaller. So most of this mass, for all we know, might actually be dark matter. Which unfortunately I can't really add in the game. But you can kind of imagine that it's all bound together by dark matter. And anyway, so that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. I wanted to create this unusual, beautiful galaxy known as Segway 2. And just for fun, let's actually maybe decelerate time a little bit and place um, our own Milky Way right next to it, just so you can actually see once again what it looks like in comparison to the Milky Way. So there is Segway 2, and we're going to go into Galaxies. And, okay, Milky Way is not here, but we have Andromeda Galaxy, so let's place Andromeda right next to it. And look at, look at how tiny it is in comparison to Andromeda. Andromeda Galaxy has close to about a trillion stars, whereas Segway 2 has only about a thousand. So there you go. There they are. My computer has slowed down to a crawl once again. And so this is how tiny it is. It's even smaller than some of the global, globular clusters, star clusters that we have in our own uh, galaxy. And let's actually begin by escaping our own system, moving away from our beautiful Earth and leaving our galaxy as well, because we're actually going to take a trip quite, quite far away to a galaxy known as IC1101. It's actually been discovered hundreds of years ago, but back then we didn't really know it was a galaxy. We thought it was a nebula. We thought it was just a nebula in, uh, in our own galaxy, but we were completely wrong, because it just so happens that that galaxy is the largest galaxy we have found to date. It is ridiculously big. Now before we start though, let's actually move away from Milky Way and I want to actually show you the size of our Milky Way. So it says di diameter of our own galaxy is approximately 126,000 light years. Now it's actually a lot larger than that because there's a lot of hidden things uh, going on here that we've discovered very recently. But for now, let's just keep this number in mind, 126,000 light years. Uh, Milky Way is actually what's known as an intermediate sized galaxy, uh, specifically an intermediate spiral sized galaxy. And there's actually uh, three main types of galaxies when, you, when you we're talking about galactic um, types. There's these ones, which are called dwarf galaxies. Uh, these are smaller usually, there are, some of them are only a few hundred light years away. There's intermediate size, which are uh, like our own Milky Way. And there are also some large galaxies that are often known as um, elliptical galaxies that can be even bigger with um, as much as 10 times as many stars and uh, with a lot more mass as well. Now we're going to go to one of these uh, um, elliptical galaxies that we've discovered back in the days. And there's actually Andromeda right there that's a little bit bigger than our, our own Milky Way. Uh, and so this particular super giant elliptical galaxy is known as IC1101. Now there's quite a lot of IC galaxies as you can see and IC stands for Index Catalog of Nebula and Star Clusters. It was actually started over a hundred years ago and uh, this particular galaxy was discovered um, or cataloged back in 1895 by a person named uh, John Dreyer. But originally it was actually discovered in 1790 by a British astronomer uh, Frederick Herschel um, who actually obviously thought this was not a galaxy but instead it was um, some sort of um, a nebula or possibly some sort of a very bright object. So as you can see, we're actually quite far away from it, um, close to a billion light years away. Um, so we're going to go there right now and we're going to move through our universe toward the spot um, where this particular galaxy is located. And here we go. All right, so we're there now. I'm going to actually just move around here a little bit just to give you an idea of what's actually going on and what you can actually see here. Let's actually move out just a little bit so you can see other galaxies around it. Now, these spots that you see are galaxies. These are actual galaxies. Some of them are as big as our own uh, Milky Way. But that right here in the middle, that's IC1101. It is tremendously huge. Its diameter is 6 million light years. 
And because this galaxy is known as a diffuse galaxy, um, or I guess super giant diffuse galaxy, we're not even sure how big exactly it is, because uh, it seems to have an edge that just keeps extending and extending. Uh, but currently, as it stands, it's uh, approximately 6 um, million light years in diameter, uh, which is something like 60 times bigger than our own Milky Way. Uh, so this is a huge, huge place. This is a tremendously big galaxy that is very, very um, unfamiliar to us and definitely looks very different from our own Milky Way. But let's actually fly into it as well. And let's see what it looks like from the inside of this galaxy, because this is what it's all about. Now, um, because this is such a huge galaxy, uh, we think that it was formed by a collision of many smaller galaxies. And we're actually going to slow down a little bit because we're going a little bit too fast. And let's fly to the center of this giant um, and we'll see stars moving across our view as we go to the center of this galaxy. Um, so we think that many different galaxies combine into one over billions of years and created this beautiful creation essentially that is absolutely massive. This is um, one of the biggest objects in our universe. Not the biggest, but one of the biggest and is definitely the most luminous and the most massive galaxy we have found so far. Uh, but once again, we don't really know exactly how big and exactly how massive. We just know that we haven't found anything um, as close to this as, as basically this galaxy. Um, so in the center of this galaxy, you'll notice that it's going to be really hard for us to see everything else. Because it's almost spherical in shape, or we think it's kind of spherical or elliptical. Um, here, being in the center means uh, the stars around you will basically... Um, cover the rest of the uh, rest of your view. So if there is a species of super smart aliens living somewhere in the middle here, it's very likely that they might not actually um, be able to ever detect us because the stars around them will actually block everything. And they might not even be aware of other galaxies or um, other things outside of their own galaxy because this is their world. It's a world covered in many, 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 many stars. Now we're getting closer to the center here and um, we're actually pretty sure that right in the center of this galaxy there is a definitely a supermassive black hole because we were able to detect its uh, radio signals and uh, um, not just radio signals but obviously things like um, x-rays and gamma rays as well. Uh, but it's very likely that all of this is uh, surrounding a supermassive black hole that's somewhere right here and we can actually try to find it by using Space Engine and we might even be able to go there in a second. Um, but you'll notice that the color in this galaxy is very different from our own. It's very golden-like, um, very almost soupy-like and that's because of the types of stars that are present here. Many supermassive galaxies and many elliptical galaxies don't actually have any new stars. All of these stars here are absolutely ancient. In, in, in other words, uh, all of the stars, almost all of the stars here, are about 7 to 8 billion years older than our own sun. So basically these are stars that are just finishing their life and one day this galaxy might actually completely disappear and become very, very dark because all of these stars will either uh, become dim uh, white dwarfs or become so dark that they will actually not be visible at all. Um, so many of these stars are very rich in metal, they're very um, dim in appearance, and so this makes this galaxy very soupy-like, very yellowish in color, uh, compared to, of course, our galaxy that's very bright and has a variety of different colors. So here you won't even actually find any nebula, or very unlikely to find many nebula. You're unlikely to find any... Um, uh, star clouds where new stars are being created and so all of this is an ancient ancient world with a variety of different stars. Alright, so we're almost there. Um, we're about 55, um, or actually we're not almost there. In comparison to the size of this galaxy we're almost there, but we're still 54,000 light years away from the center, uh, which is basically like half of Milky Way away. Uh, so we, got, we have to move a little bit closer to the center, and then we're going to try to find the supermassive black hole in the center here. But as you can see, there's a lot of stars. This is trillions and trillions and trillions of stars. So many more stars than in our own um, galaxy. So I'm slowly inching my way toward the center of this galaxy, and there's actually um, a few globular clusters that I've detected so far, uh, which seem to have actually started appearing... Um, out of nowhere and I think right in this cluster right here this is actually where we possibly will find the supermassive black hole. We're going to go inside and see what we can find in there 
this is essentially the central globular cluster where I'm guessing a lot of really ancient stars, a lot of uh, supermassive black holes, or possibly at least one supermassive black hole are, and we might even be able to see um, things are moving around it if we go right in the middle of it. Let's actually go inside and explore and um, we'll find out what is in the center of IC1101. And so we're about to enter the ancient world of IC1101 and hopefully discover its ultra-massive uh, black hole in the middle. Uh, now, we might not be able to see it this way because it may have actually not rendered just yet, but as soon as I detect it using the Space Engine Search um, function, we'll be able to detect it right away. And for some reason, I actually failed to find it using the search, but what I did instead is I inched my way slowly toward the location where um, the black hole was supposed to be, and it just suddenly appeared in front of me. It was actually kind of terrifying at first because it is so, so big and so, so bright. So let's go and explore it. I've never been here before. This is my first time in IC1101, this, the biggest galaxy that we've found so far. And this is possibly one of the biggest supermassive black holes that we might have discovered as well. So let's uh, check it out. There's, as you can see, there's quite a lot of stars orbiting around it. Um, and uh, there's very likely to be quite a lot of interesting things to see here including obviously the size of that thing look at how big this is it is so much bigger than um our own supermassive black holes sagittarius a and this is very 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 bright very bright look at the size of that con um accretion disk it is huge all right so welcome to the supermassive black hole at the center of ic 1101 it is right there in the middle let's go inside check it out and possibly look at some of these stars as well now unfortunately i don't really know uh, how big and how massive this super uh, massive black hole is because it doesn't actually say um in this particular instance but uh what i can tell you is that we can definitely enter it and we can definitely destroy the universe or i guess the universe will just end in front of our eyes as we enter the super massive black hole but let's not do that just yet. Let's actually just get out of here. Uh, it, it does actually take a little bit longer to get out of the supermassive black hole than it does from our own uh, Milky Way. And I am actually having trouble with it. Hey, what is that? Is that a, is that a star? It's not supposed to be here. Um, all right, so let's actually move out of here for a second. And it, it it's surprisingly, um, takes surprisingly longer than it does usually. So here we are. We have this super huge accretion disk orbiting around uh, the supermassive black hole. And uh, look at the number of stars. I'm going to enable orbits here. And you can kind of see how many stars it has orbiting around it as well. As a matter of fact, I can actually show you right here on top of the screen what each of these stars is. Let's actually slow down because it's getting a little bit too slow. And you can kind of see there's uh, so many of them, so many different stars. Many of these stars will obviously contain planets, many of these stars will possibly even contain life. But I don't want to really spend too much time looking for it. I will let you guys do this yourselves, especially if you're interested about this particular system uh, and of course this particular galaxy. But before we finish this video, let's actually take a look at what it, all of this may look like from um, one of these systems, from one of these stars that may have planets orbiting around them. So we're just going to kind of stay here for a little bit. I'm going to accelerate time. And this is essentially what it looks like to orbit a supermassive black hole. What it's like to actually live in this particular environment that's probably very, very deadly simply because of the amount of radiation that's released from this uh, really massive object. Anyway, so that's all I wanted to say uh, about this system and about this galaxy in this video. And hopefully now you know a little bit more about IC1101. Hopefully you'll go into Space Engine and discover it for yourself. And we're about to go through the accretion disk right here and boom, we're dead. Hello wonderful viewer, this is Anton and welcome to What The Math. This is going to be a video about a very recent discovery from I think it was March 4th of 2016 where a team using Hubble telescope, the beautiful telescope that orbits around our beautiful planet and is looking at all of these really cool planets and stars out there 
it was actually able to discover something really unusual. And specifically here, they basically, and by they, I mean the team who was using the, um, uh, the telescope, was able to push the telescope to the limit and discover uh, the farthest or the most distant galaxy we have ever seen. This galaxy has been uh, named GNZ11, and it actually represents an image that is something like 13.4 billion years old. Now, that's just 400 million uh, years after the Big Bang, so it's actually showing us the universe when it was very, 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 very young. Uh, just to give you a comparison, let's just say if I'm just over 30 years old, it's, it would show an image when I was just a year old, so it's about 3% of the actual age of the universe. And the reason why we know it's so old and that this galaxy is actually really, really far away from us is of, because of something called redshift. Now, redshift is a concept I've tried to explain in previous videos where basically if something is moving away from us and if something is moving away from us really fast and is also very, very far away from us, it will create um, uh, something called redshift where the entire spectrum of light gets stretched out into toward red color and here, the redshift that we're talking about is equivalent to about 11.1, .1, which is actually one of the highest, if not the highest, redshifts we've ever detected. And if you go to a website called um, Wolf from Alpha, and you type in uh, cosmological redshift 11.1, .1, this is what it will actually give you. It will tell you that this uh, image is about 13.3 billion years old, and it's about 32.3 billion light years away from us. Now, that's actually really, really, really far away. Uh, in other words, it's something that's actually beyond our reach. We, we can never actually reach that far. Even if we fly in the fastest spaceship, we'll never be able to get there. Now, interestingly, this is also kind of beyond the actual theoretical size of the universe. Now, if you think about it, um, and if you actually try to reach the end of the universe in Space Engine, it's somewhere around 14 billion um, light years away from the center of the Milky Way. And that's because there's something called the visible limit of the universe. Now, that doesn't mean that that's where the universe ends. That just means that this is actually the part of the universe that we can see. But there is more of the universe after that. And this universe will never be visible to us because it's actually receding away or moving away from us faster than the speed of light. And that's because of the way that the space itself stretches. This is something that Einstein tried to show us with his amazing theories uh, on general relativity where he basically talks about how space is actually a kind of an expandable and foldable and maneuverable um, thing that is actually called space-time and we can actually uh, manipulate it if we put uh, a large enough mass um, in the center of it. And a person by the name Hubble was even able to estimate how fast the universe actually expands away from us. Now, so this particular galaxy is moving away from us and it's uh, basically at a distance of about 32.3 billion light years. That's ridiculously far away. And just to give you an idea, this is what actually it looks like in Space Engine. You can really not see anything. It's complete darkness there because that's basically where most of the galaxies are already invisible to us. We will never be able to see them ever again. Even though earlier on, when the universe was still younger, we, we could actually see all of these galaxies, but unfortunately they have receded to the part of the universe that is expanding faster than the speed of light, so we'll never be able to see them. But let's actually talk a little bit more about this particular galaxy that we've discovered. So it's um, it's a little bit smaller than the Milky Way. It's about 25 times smaller, and it also has just 1% of the mass of the Milky Way. But um, even in that particular galaxy, we can already see developing stars. We can see um, supernovas. And one of the reasons it's, uh, it's visible to us is because it's so bright. It means that it had a lot of really early um, star activity, which also means that there were very likely to planets around uh, those stars. And for all we know, maybe one of them was actually a terrestrial planet. And because this galaxy is so old and because the possibility of having a terrestrial planet in a galaxy somewhere far away is actually quite high, it also suggests that maybe, just maybe, there was even life back then. So maybe 400 uh, million years after the Big Bang, there already was life somewhere in the universe. 
And obviously this is just a speculation, we may never be even able to prove any of this, but because there are stars and you know, because there are possibly planets around those stars, the chances are actually quite high that there was somewhere out there a galaxy with life and possibly even an intelligent life that was already thriving in a galaxy really really far away a long long time ago, just like in Star Wars. But what's more, even more interesting is that we actually do have another telescope that's going to be launched into space very soon, and not really soon, but uh, in 2018, there's actually a telescope called James Webb Space Telescope that will be a lot more powerful than Hubble and will be actually able to see a lot more of these galaxies that will hopefully one day be able to see in a lot more detail so we can kind of possibly even detect something from them, maybe even some sort of a signal. But also for all we know, maybe this galaxy doesn't actually exist anymore because this image is actually 13.4 billion years old. For all we know, this galaxy was already absorbed by a much larger galaxy or maybe it actually lived out its days and is just a big black hole by now. And because its stars were so bright and were actually able to produce so much light, maybe, just maybe, all of these stars have already been extinguished and don't actually produce any more light anymore. But I guess the important part from all of this is that even 400 million years after the Big Bang, when the universe was still very young, there were already were functioning galaxies that actually were very similar in appearance and in structure to the galaxies that, that we see today and that we actually have today. And although we we're probably never actually going to visit any of these really, really far away galaxies, it's just interesting to see how the universe actually looked and what it was it was like when it was still very young and when our galaxy Milky Way was not possibly even around yet. Because from what we actually know about our galaxy, it is only about 13.2 billion years old, meaning that it was very likely produced something like 200 or 300 million uh, years after this galaxy that we see right here. So this is technically our bigger brother, or possibly sister. And I guess the takeaway message from all of this is that, well, first of all, Hubble telescope can actually see a lot more than we actually imagined. And second of all, the next telescope called James Webb Space Telescope will be able to discover a lot more dimmer, a lot more cooler, and a lot more beautiful galaxies out there and possibly even find a new home for our species and for the human race. Because, I mean, this is what it's all about, right? The reason we were using these telescopes and the reason we're trying to learn so much about space is because we are actually trying to find another planet to call home and possibly even colonize the entire galaxy one day. And so hopefully one day in the future, we might be able to actually create the universe that we see in a lot of science fiction movies like Star Trek, where we are actually a spacefaring race that is able to visit other planets, visit other stars and explore the galaxy and also the rest of the universe. So this right here is, as you can probably see, a very, very large galaxy. This is a typical elliptical galaxy and is currently listed as one of the largest we've actually discovered. Now, elliptical galaxies are very unusual to begin with, but what's really strange about this one is that right in the middle right there, there doesn't seem to be any central black hole. Well, let's actually slow down a little bit and let's uh, first take a look at uh, where we can find out more information about this. And unfortunately, there isn't really much we know about this galaxy. As a matter of fact, Wikipedia only lists uh, this galaxy right here under the list of the largest galaxies as uh, one of the galaxies right here. Now, it tells you the size and it tells you the distance to the galaxy. It tells you the type as well. But that's all we really know about this except for the fact that there seems to be no central black hole. Now, how do we know this? Well, by looking at the central region of this galaxy, the scientists discovered that this bulge that you see right here is the largest bulge they've, they've seen of all of the galaxies. In other words, the central region of this galaxy is so big that it just doesn't make sense. If there was a central black hole, it would not be so big. But how is it that this galaxy is staying together? How is it even possible for it to not just fly apart? Well, I wanted to use the Universe Sandbox to just demonstrate to you that a galaxy does not need to have a central black hole to basically stay a galaxy. As a matter of fact, if we were to go back to our own Milky Way, and then if we were to imagine basically erasing Sagittarius A star from the center of the Milky Way, 
what do you think will happen? Do you think the galaxy would actually fly apart and uh, become just a bunch of independent stars? Well, the reality is that it's very unlikely to happen, mostly because the actual black hole only takes up a very, very small fraction of the total mass of the central bulge and also of the galaxy itself. There are very few galaxies out there that actually have supermassive black holes that are a big part of them. Now, let's actually try to simulate this and see if a galaxy can survive without um, an actual black hole in the middle. And we're going to do this by using um, Universe Sandbox. And here is a randomly generated galaxy in Universe Sandbox um, that seems to be a spiral galaxy, so it's not an elliptical galaxy like the one you just saw called A2261 BCG. But we are going to assume that um, this kind of happens to basically any galaxy. So here, if I were to go in the middle, well, first of all, actually, let's accelerate time just to see if the galaxy stays stable over time. So we're going to make this run a little bit faster until you see stars move around. And it seems like the galaxy is sort of more or less skipping together, and most of this is because of two things. One is that this central bulge right here already has a tremendous mass, and just by itself it creates a huge, huge, um, basically a ripple in space-time because of the mass that is enough to hold the rest of the galaxy together. On the other hand, 95% of this galaxy is also dark matter, and it's really the dark matter that keeps it all together. If I were to remove dark matter, as I'll do in a few minutes, you'll see that it just flies apart. But will the actual black hole in the middle keep it together? Well, let's actually see what happens. We're going to go in and zoom in here and basically remove the supermassive black hole right there that's currently um, approximately 50 billion masses of the sun. It's quite a lot, actually. A lot bigger than our own um, black hole in the middle of the Milky Way. And let's run the simulation again and see what happens. Now remember, the dark matter is still there. It hasn't actually disappeared. And notice what happens. It starts kind of uh, increasing the central region. In other words, the central uh, space inside this galaxy starts getting more poofy. It, it kind of expands. And this is exactly what we actually observe in A2261 BCG. Now, this particular galaxy seems to actually not do as well as I hoped. It seems to actually kind of fall apart. But let's see if it might stay together after a few uh, million years. And by itself, this actually technically might even create an elliptical galaxy out of the spiral galaxy that we had before. Now, here is an observation that is very interesting. Because this central black hole is gone now, the uh, central region of the black hole expands dramatically, becomes a lot less dense, and the galaxy itself is also a lot larger than it used to be. Now, it's not a spiral galaxy anymore because there's nothing to orbit around, and technically this is actually, from a distance at least, um, an elliptical galaxy. And this is kind of what we observe in a lot of galaxies like A2261 BCG. But most elliptical galaxies do have central black holes. This one, though, even though it's one of the most massive we've discovered and one of the biggest we've discovered, seems to have nothing. As a matter of fact, compared to our own Milky Way, uh, well, let's just imagine this is A2261 BCG, our own Milky Way would be about 10 times smaller, so it would be only about this big, and it's about 50 times less massive. In other words, um, even though our own Milky Way has about 400 billion stars, A2261 BCG has something like 10 trillion stars in there. And as you can see, even without a central black hole, this seems to survive just fine. It just doesn't look the same. Now, we are not entirely sure how this galaxy lost its black hole. There is some speculation about it currently possibly having uh, some black holes in the middle or possibly just having diffuse black holes. And there's also some theories that su suggest that maybe in the past, this particular galaxy actually had two black holes due to a collision of some sort. And those two black holes just, with time, and because of the orbit that they had, basically kicked each other out. In other words, they were orbiting around one another, and with time just kind of flew apart. Now, I think that's actually probably the best explanation we have about how these black holes disappear, because there is really no other reason for them not to be there. Now, what do you think would happen if I were to remove dark matter from here? And this is actually the big moment of truth. Dark matter is really the most important part of any galaxy. As soon as it's gone, as soon as it disappears, 
the entire galaxy kind of just evaporates and flies away into the abyss of space. There's no more galaxy without dark matter. Now, interestingly, one of the simulations here doesn't have any dark matter. So this is the simulation where you have a, a supernova in the galaxy. And it does have a very, very nice looking spiral galaxy, even with a bar and everything, that represents our own Milky Way. If I were to remove the supermassive black hole from this particular galaxy, and in this case it's the Milky Way sort of representation, notice how without this particular supermassive black hole, this galaxy just turns into like a ring. Now, here's an interesting part. We've actually observed galaxies that look like this. There are actually pictures of several galaxies that seem to have this ring-like shape in the middle. Why? Well, maybe just maybe for the same reason, that they don't have a central black hole anymore. Uh, so that by itself is kind of interesting. But notice how this is what happens when you have no dark matter, or I guess almost no dark matter, and no central black hole in the middle. So this is kind of what occurs. Now here's another simulation of a galaxy. This is actually a relatively massive and a relatively large galaxy as well. And I wanted to just kind of show you what happens if there is a black hole in the middle and then we just kind of remove the dark matter instead. And you'll see that uh, this kind of shows you how galaxies really fall apart pretty quickly without dark matter. Um, now, in terms of black holes at the center of those galaxies, pretty much all of the galaxies we, ha we found have them. But many dwarf galaxies, many small galaxies, don't have central black holes. And this is actually, uh, so by this I mean A2261 BCG, is the first large or supermassive galaxy that we've seen that has no supermassive black hole. Why? Well, that's actually a good question. Uh, so one day we'll hopefully discover more of them, and one day we'll hopefully be able to explain how those black holes actually disappear. But for now, that's really kind of all we know. We know that... Um, most galaxies need a supermassive black hole, but don't have to have them. And we know that even without a supermassive black hole, a galaxy can exist just fine. And if we were to remove this particular supermassive black hole, once again, if there's no dark matter, it kind of just fl flies apart and becomes really nothing. But however, if we were to do the same uh, and just remove the supermassive black hole, but actually keep the dark matter in there, it's probably not actually going to fly apart and instead become, once again, an elliptical galaxy. And I guess this kind of goes to show that um, even though we assume that all galaxies have something really massive in the middle, that something massive doesn't have to be an actual black hole. It can be the actual bulge itself. And this bulge itself creates such a huge mass that it's enough for uh, most galaxies to use this as basically the center. And the rest of the stars and the rest of the matter just kind of orbits around it. And I'm sure dark matter also helps as well. So that's all I wanted to talk about in this video. And hopefully you learn a little bit more about A2261 BCG. And here's actually the, the picture that we've taken of this galaxy. You can actually see the actual representation of um, 2261, also known as Abel 2661, from the Hubble telescope that took this uh, photo back in 2012. And th that's, of course, the big galaxy right here in the middle. And the smaller galaxies next to it are uh, actually closer to, to us than this one. So this is a huge, huge galaxy. So in this simulation, you're about to witness two uh, galaxies similar to the Milky Way collide and intermix the material and basically combine into one. Now, this will actually happen to Milky Way in about four-ish billion years when uh, the Andromeda galaxy decides to come close to us and collide with us. Now, there's actually quite a lot of interesting things that will happen here, but one thing that you may expect will definitely not happen, and that is the star collision. Each of those individual particles that you see represents a star, and not a single one will very likely collide at all. The collision chance between a star and another star as galaxies collide is practically zero. Unless the two galaxies involved are extremely large, there's going to be no collisions. Their black holes might collide and merge, but that's really the only type of a collision we might observe here. One interesting thing about this, though, is, of course, the fact that why the collisions don't occur. And they don't occur simply because the stars are just 
too far away from each other. The amount of space one star takes in comparison to the distance between them is just too insignificant. And in one of the videos that I made about a year and a half ago, I've actually even mathematically showed you the chance for a single star colliding with another star when two galaxies collide. And it was ridiculously small. But anyway, so what will actually happen in terms of the other effects? Now, one thing here to notice is that the shape of the galaxy has been completely changed and what has now been created is known as an irregular galaxy. And when two large galaxies collide, most of the time they leave these irregular galaxies behind and these are usually full of nothing but really dim red stars, uh, leftovers of these uh, very, very large collisions and basically, for the most part, there's no more star creation. These irregular galaxies, for the most part, are sort of dead. There's no more new stars created, just old stars dying. There's a lot of these irregular galaxies out there in the universe, but as you can see, this one here may have actually created a larger uh, spiral galaxy, which actually doesn't happen very often. So it, it can still create a spiral galaxy as well. Now, Let's go back for a second and let's look at the simulation again. The first thing that happens when two galaxies collide is that they actually cre create these really, really long tendrils. These long, uh, kind of almost like corridors or hallways of stars and gas. And there's one that's been created right here. There it is. And th these always seem to occur and they actually um, stretch all the way through here and they also stick out on the other side as well and there will be one sticking out from this galaxy as well and these occur because of the tidal forces basically the tidal forces from two galaxies stretch these so so thin and so wide that they always get these long arm-like projections and these actually have been discovered a long time ago back in 1941 by a very interesting scientist who did this without any kind of computer simulations. So back then, um, the so-called proto-computational scientist Eric Kohlberg investigated the um, galactic collisions using nothing but the lamps. And he basically placed a bunch of lamps together and observed uh, how they interacted and how much light they um, shone on each other, projected on each other. Uh, by moving them around and so depending on, on how much light the lamps received he would move them in certain locations and basically he kind of created this this using different lamps so imagine this galaxy represent was represented with different lamps so one big lamp here one here one here one here and so on and he would actually move them around um for you know several times several days and calculated the various amounts of lights that they would receive from each other and the light represented gravity and because light and gravity have very similar sort of properties basically they decrease in uh in power over a certain amount of distance he was able to quite accurately predict that these arms would actually form and was also able to predict what would actually happen at the end of the galactic merger and later on Eller um, and jury tumor did this again using actual computers and were able to show that these so-called tidal tails uh, of ga gas and stars were basically created pretty much every time galaxies collided. So these galaxies will merge, they'll collide, they'll interact with each other and essentially when they do they often get ripped apart and lose their shape. But apart from losing the shape, another very important thing happened. So, when the galaxy just begins to merge, on the inside it probably has nebula, there's the one right there, they probably have a lot of gas in between the stars, and as this gas and as these nebula approach each other, they actually become very, very active uh, sites of star creation. So as soon as these two galaxies start merging, they'll actually, st they'll actually brighten up, they'll become really bright because the star creation in these galaxies will increase by something like 10 times. And that's because all of this gas suddenly starts mixing and colliding and creating these stars. And essentially these galaxies become very, very active. So active as a matter of fact that when they're left, um, already combined and basically when they stop combining most of this gas will be used up and so these galaxies kind of remain inactive and practically dead 
And during this collision, which usually takes anywhere from a few uh, dozen million years to several hundred million years, something like several billion stars will actually be created. So there will be a lot of a lot of interaction, a lot of new stars will be born. Most of them will actually be very massive, so they won't very they won't live for a very long time, and usually they'll kind of explode and create supernova and then more stars. So there will be a lot of creation and a lot of death of different stars. So uh, at the end of this though, only dying, only cool, and only red dwarfs will probably remain. With some exceptions, of course, with occasional um, brown dwarf, neutron star, and a black hole. So basically the rest of the galaxy here will be a complete mess. But as you can see right here, this process is actually very, very long. It takes quite a long time for two galaxies to merge completely. So right now we're going to start with zero years, and you'll see that it will take up to about 100 million years to, to merge. And this means that we actually haven't really observed any of these. The only reason we know about all of this is, is that because we were able to find uh, various merging galaxies in, in different sort of frames of reference and in, in different times of their merger and we're able to combine them and kind of see how they progress and so here's actually a picture of eight different galaxies and eight different uh times of merger and so for the most part we now think that we kind of understand mergers pretty well although obviously there will be some surprises as well and don't forget that when galaxies merge there is also something invisible going on here and this is the so-called dark matter now Maybe I'll actually start a new simulation just to show you how dark matter interacts as well. And here what we'll do is we'll just place two galaxies side by side. And the red spots here represent the dark matter. And now if we actually try to accelerate time here, hopefully without crashing our game, you'll see that um, the dark matter will also be interacting and it will also be merging. But because it doesn't really interact with regular matter, uh, and because dark matter usually represents up to about 90% of the total mass of the galaxy, it's really the dark matter that will actually, at the end, establish the final shape of the merging galaxy. So when the merger is complete, it will be up to dark matter to decide what shape will be uh, present and what will actually happen to the actual galaxy at the end. So that's really all I wanted to say in this video, and I wanted to kind of demonstrate to you that the galactic mergers are a little bit more complicated than we usually think about them. And at the end of the galactic merger between Andromeda and the Milky Way, it's very likely that very little will be, will be left behind, at least in terms of new stars that might no longer be made after the merger. So the galactic merger between our galaxy and the Andromeda will probably end up creating some kind of an irregular galaxy full of nothing but red stars red dwarf specifically so let's watch what happens here with these two galaxies and the dark matter as it interacts with each other and so this is actually based on a very interesting study uh where the scientists looked at the very unusual stars around the central black hole and uh, looked at their interaction and using this interaction they created this very very cool video completely in 360 where you're basically right in the middle of our galaxy and what you see around you are various stars and uh, various types of radiation that those stars emit and um, all of this is actually done using data that was collected over several years now what's interesting is that this is obviously not in real time this is like hundreds of years of uh, stars emitting stuff but for the most part it actually looks really really cool and very unusual now this is not all i wanted to show you in this video and as a matter of fact you can just watch this video by yourself in the link in the description below what i really wanted to do is to show you um first of all what uh, sagittarius a star looks like in space engine and kind of explain how these scientists were able to even discover all of this data and uh, imagine what it might be like to be right here in the middle and look around you and see those beautiful stars orbiting so first of all, let me just accelerate time here a little bit just so we can actually see uh, stars orbit around us. 
Uh, there's actually quite a few stars in this particular region, and many of them we know very, very well. But uh, here we go. So this is kind of what um, this particular video from Chandra Observatory um, shows you. So it shows you the motion of those stars. So how exactly were they able to imagine this? Well, turns out um, if you study a very specific type of a star known as Wolf Riot Star, about which I talked about maybe two years ago, you can actually study the layout of a specific region of space. Okay, let me, let me backtrack a little bit just to kind of give you an idea what I'm talking about here. So, what exactly is a Wolf Riot Star for those of you who are not familiar with them? Let's go to one of them. This is actually the closest to our um, solar system, known as Theta Moschei. Um, this particular object is a typical star. It's, you know, if you look at it, it does, it does behave like a star, it looks like a star, but there is one difference. These stars are actually uh, known to emit unusual wavelengths that don't seem to make any sense or don't exist in other stars. In other words, these stars are kind of fluorescent. You know the stuff that glows in the dark? Well, these stars do that too. And the reason they do this is actually very, very unusual. I'm going to demonstrate this in Universe Simbox in a few seconds. Now, um, what we know about this particular object is that in visual light, um, the Wolf Riot stars are not particularly bright. As a matter of fact, if you were to look at them using a telescope, you wouldn't really possibly even see one. But in ultraviolet light, they shine really, really, really brightly. As a matter of fact, they are some of the brightest stars you can see with ultraviolet uh, telescope. So, uh, they do seem to emit unusual light. Now, let me just show you what's actually happening here. So, in the middle we have what's known as a Wolf Riot star core. It's basically a typical star um, that was very, very massive, but as it's slowing down its burning of hydrogen process, and basically starts burning carbon and, and oxygen and so on, it kind of forms this core, and a lot of the outer shell starts being thrown away into the outer space, and in this case, it forms a kind of an envelope, or I guess you could call it almost like a nebula, around the star. So we're going to try to create this right now using the Universe Sandbox. So here we're just going to release a bunch of particles, and so these particles are essentially the outer shell of the star. And as they start escaping the star, the inner core starts burning really, really bright, really, really powerfully, and a lot of its emissions start influencing these particles. And as these particles get excited by the radiation from the inner core, they start emitting other types of light. So this is what we would call fluorescence. So in other words, this whole outer shell starts glowing in light that wouldn't be possible otherwise. And as this happens, this whole thing becomes really, really, really bright in ultraviolet light and also creates this very unusual environment where you have very super hot, super bright central core and a kind of an outer shell that covers it and starts glowing because of it. Now, this is what we would call, this whole thing would be Wolf Riot Star. And Wolf Riot Star is actually an intermediary stage in the evolution of very large, very massive stars. Usually right after this stage finishes, um, the typical next step would be a supernova that would then result either in a neutron star in the middle or in a black hole. For this reason, because this stage doesn't last very long, we normally don't see very many of these stars. There's only a few uh, dozens or just under a hundred that we've discovered, and we don't normally um, detect very many of them. But near the central region of our galaxy, specifically very, very close to Sagittarius A star, within about two light years, or 1.5 light years, the scientists were able to discover at least 20 of them. And this is really cool because we were able to find these very rare, very unusual stars orbiting in this region around Sagittarius A um, star, which is our central black hole. Now, that's not all. As these stars orbit, and as they basically release more and more of those uh, shells that I just showed you, basically as their outer shells get released um, from the inner core, and it's kind of hard to see it here, but what I'm trying to show you is this. Those shells, or those released particles, those materials, start to interact with each other. So right about maybe now, I'm gonna try to see if I can make this a little bit more visible. 
right around now, they're going to actually intersect with each other and collide with each other. So I decided to change the simulation a little bit, just to show it to you in more detail. So anyway, so as these pulses collide with each other, they create shock waves. And these shock waves are super, super hot, super highly energetic, and they actually create a lot of emissions that we can detect from our planet Earth. And this is exactly what happens here. So as these Wolf Riot emissions collide with each other and create shock waves that we can detect from Earth, we can actually use this data and the interaction of the shockwaves with the central black hole to create these very, very cool looking, very, very cool looking, very beautiful simulations that the Chandra telescope was able to create. So here, all of this is created entirely from the data collected from those Wolf Riot stars. And this entire simulation demonstrates to you how we can actually use uh, the data from these unusual collisions of these very rare stars to basically lay out and create a, a very realistic, very cool looking map of not only the central um, galaxy or basically the central region of our Milky Way, but actually pretty much anything. So in other words, we could totally use the data from these stars to um, map out the entire galaxy at some point and know exactly where certain gravitational anomalies are, where certain black holes might be hiding, and most importantly, create a very interesting uh, visual map of our galaxy that could then be used in the future to explore it, of course. So this is yet another technique that we can use to create uh, maps of stars, galaxies, and of course, other regions of space. Well, anyway, check out the video I posted and I showed you in the video. This is a video from the Chandra Observatory. It's really cool, it's in 360 and you get to actually see all of it in a lot more detail. Come back tomorrow to learn something else. Thank you so much for watching, guys. I'll see you tomorrow. Space out. And as always, bye-bye.